As soon as the new IMAX were announced, I knew exactly which color I needed. And we have a yellow 24 inch M1 iMac here, and we're gonna see how it does for filmmaking and photography use cases. I've only had it for a few days, so I could just kind of take it for a spin, but I really like this machine. And it's gonna be pretty easy to talk about because M1s have really simplified the whole Mac line. But first, let's take a look at the physical design of this thing. Apple basically has a tritone going on here. There are three different colors. On the front, you've got a lighter pastel. This is the most yellow color on it. The base is definitely gold, like you can see it. it looks like a gold medal you win in the Olympics. And if we spin around, take a look at the back. I was expecting this to be more of like a, a pure yellow and in person. I don't know how it's translating on YouTube, but it feels pretty gold. Like um, it's, it's definitely a deep yellow, not a light and bright yellow. The materials are kind of perfect and beautiful. It's extremely thin, 11 millimeters, so just barely thicker than an iPhone. And the fit and finish is exactly as good as you'd expect. The hinge is wonderful, just like all previous iMacs. It's kind of bringing together the new world of Apple where everything feels really perfect and professional with the old Apple that was fun and playful. Back then, they're using plastic to make their iMacs bright colors. But now it's like, it's the professional materials with the fun colors. They've made the mouse keyboard and the trackpad all match. I mean, it's a it's a perfect match to this metal, like it is the same metal. And it also comes with a USB-C to lightning cable that matches the braided cable in the back of the computer as well. Everything is color coordinated all the way through. When I set up the computer, the whole interface was color matched as well. And even once it's running, they start you off with a matching background and also the interface items on the side here or whatever color you bought your iMac in. So there's all these little details that I really appreciate that Apple has done. So whichever one you got, everything matches it. Or as always, just change the background. If you're having trouble picturing what the color really is, here's one way to tell. This should give you a good idea of what it is. Here's the iMac box. And this is the color you've been seeing in all the marketing and press stuff. So just as a reference, keep this in your mind. And then this is the iMac. And you can just see they are different colors. Like they're not exactly the same. Maybe this will give you an idea of, you know, wh what it actually is. But obviously you should go and check these out in person if you can. And while we're looking at the back of the machine, let's talk about this magnetic power cable for a second. Now it's not MagSafe. I think a lot of people were thinking that at first, but it is completely different, a whole new engineering design. And it is not meant to pop out if you trip over it. That's why it's not MagSafe. When these were announced, there was a big sigh on Twitter when we first saw white bezels. A lot of designers, filmmakers, photographers don't like them and neither do I. I was hoping we'd have black bezels because it just blends in with the screen more. It's a little less disruptive to your eye. But I don't think it's a big deal that these are white. So let's keep in mind, these are the consumer computers and most people will not mind the white at all. And while it's in front of me, I don't either. I do have a few little complaints about the execution of it. it drives me crazy, this little black border around the screen, uh, just a tiny little gap between the actual bezel and the actual display. Most people are not gonna notice, but I did, and hey, that's why I want black bezels. All right, now let's take a look at how this thing actually performs, especially in terms of photo and video production, because that's, that's what I do. First of all, I'm gonna have to start screen recording. So that becomes one of the things that's taxing the system as we do all this, but let's crack open Final Cut Pro. At this point, M1 Macs aren't new, so you've probably already seen their performance a little bit, and it's very good. In terms of single core performance, it beats pretty much everything out there. This is some footage from an upcoming video that we've got, and I've had trouble editing the C70 clips that we shoot on my 15-inch MacBook Pro, which is pretty well spec'd out but this plays them very smooth. There isn't the same necessity to create proxies. And what we're looking at is pretty intensive. We have a plugin splitting these two 4K videos that are playing at the same time, plus we're displaying the histograms and the vector scopes and stuff. And let's try adding some conversion LUTs. These are my LUTs, link available in the description. So that is converting from C-Log to Rec. 709. Do it on the other one. Cool, that looks a lot better and we'll keep playing it back here. So yeah, it's very smooth. With 4K footage, it can handle a lot and it can even handle one stream of 8K which I don't shoot, but that's pretty amazing. What's so interesting about the M1 to me is that it means any creator that's just getting started and buys their first machine, because this is relatively affordable, can have something that they can edit anything with. They can take projects as far as they want, and their machine is not a limitation. 
kind of the same way it is with iPhones. You get an iPhone and you can just shoot any kind of production. There aren't better phones out there. And that's not to say that this is the best Mac for editing videos or whatever it is you're doing, but it's very, very good and it won't get in your way, kind of regardless of what you're trying to do with it. M1 couldn't come at a better time because we're also at this turning point with a lot of the cameras that have come out recently, like the Canon C70 we're shooting on here or Canon R5 or Sony a7S III or Sony FX3 or, all these cameras shoot on really compressed formats that are super hard to work with on older computers. Even powerful computers from last year really struggle, and the M1 doesn't. By the way, check out the stabilization on this footage. We've got a video coming up showing this off. This is no gimbal. This is just handheld. It's insane. So I'm using Final Cut right now, and that is optimized to an inch of its life and works great on every Mac. DaVinci Resolve is also working really well on the M1s, but you will find that Adobe Premiere not as great. They haven't optimized it yet. It still runs an emulation, so it works. It's just not impressive. But look, if you're editing on a Mac, just don't bother with Premiere. <laughs> All right, let's do some photography. I'm gonna time how long does it take for Lightroom to launch. Starting now. All right. One disappointing thing I learned with the Mac Pro is that Lightroom Classic, which is what most professionals use, doesn't utilize multiple cores, like more than about three. So if you have a ton, it's no good to you. Fortunately, the M1 has really fast single core performance. So let's just pick a photo here and we'll edit it real quick. I'll just throw one of my presets on here. All right, and let's just see how long does it take uh, Photoshop to launch. 11 seconds and we're editing. Now let's take a look at Capture One, which is what I've been using more lately as my photo editing software of choice. And if you want to learn more about photography, I recommend you subscribe because there are a lot of videos about it on this channel and Max and more, and maybe you are subscribed already. So honestly, photography is not that taxing. All of the software can handle it just fine, but you do have to keep in mind what has been optimized for M1 and so far Capture One hasn't. They said that they're going to do it soon, but you should keep an eye on that when you're deciding what you're going to buy. All right. So just for fun, I don't know. I'm going to select everything in here. I'm going to start saving these to the desktop. Well, these export, let's talk about the chin real quick, which some people didn't like and I have absolutely no problem with. Basically, there's this tweet that sums it up perfectly. If you look at a regular no bezel monitor that has nothing going on, it is completely generic. You do not know who made it. Looking at this, you know that this is an iMac because it has a history of over a decade of design language and the chin is part of what makes it look like the Mac is a face, which I know, I know that's kind of hard to imagine, but it always has been that. Going back to the original Mac, there is a bit of human structure in the look of this. That's why we're calling it a chin even. Anyway, keeping that design language makes it definitively Macintosh and I think it absolutely makes sense and they should not remove it. However, they should release a monitor soon that doesn't have a chin because we all need just like a good affordable Apple monitor. I wanted a second opinion on how this iMac performs for creators. So I had Stephen Hackett on my podcast who has a lot of great podcasts of his own on the Relay FM network where he is also a co-founder. So Stephen, how do you feel that this new iMac is gonna work for most creators out there? I think it's super exciting if you look at people who are, are making those first steps in their creator journey. It used to be that you were penalized by buying the most affordable Macs, right? Because they were slow. I mean, the iMac came with a spinning hard drive for crying out loud. And now you have this amazing, thin, beautiful machine that has the M1 in it that means you can edit streams of 4K on a machine that costs $14.99. That's never really been possible before. And so I almost envy people getting into this at the first time because they're going to miss all the days you and I had of, uh, you know, proxy workflows and rendering <laughs> while you go out for lunch. Like the M1 just solves a bunch of that stuff. Yeah, they won't know how good they've got it. I know there are <laughs> YouTubers out there that have already been kind of full-time M1, even, edit even editing 8K does work wow. on an M1. And that just... That didn't work on even uh, much more expensive, you know, 60-inch MacBook Pros. And uh, oh, yeah. you, know, you really needed top of the line before. If somebody's just getting started, do you, where would you recommend they buy? Like, what would you direct them to buy in the current options of the 24-inch iMac? The orange one. Definitely do the orange <laughs> one. <laughs> Wait, that is great advice. Yeah. You know, I think look at uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM if you can swing it. 
Uh, they top out at two terabytes, but external SSDs are so fast now. I don't think you've got to spend all your budget on storage. But I think uh, I think definitely do the the RAM and have fun with the finish. One more thing creators should be thinking about is the ports on here. There are two Thunderbolt and two USB-C. Some of the Macs, the cheapest iMac, will have only two Thunderbolts. So I don't know, if you can afford it, definitely worth getting at least the mid-range model. But that's one of the things that makes me really excited for all the professional Macs because I'm sure they're gonna have all the ports we need. Rumors say maybe even a card reader, which is missing from this, unfortunately. There is a headphone jack on the side. There are new microphones and cameras in here. Let's test those out real quick. This is the sound of the new microphones. There's three of them up there and they do a much better job than the old ones. This actually matters a lot for anybody that has been in Zoom a little more lately. And also when you watch TV talk show hosts having guests on that only talk into their laptop, you want it to sound well better than it sounds now and it does. The webcam is also updated, it is 1080p and it has the image signal processing that they kind of ripped out of the iPhones. Not quite as good, but much better. I appreciate it. What do you guys, think? like is this better or is it the same? I think it's getting better. I do wish like some of the highlights are kind of off. The other upgrade is by taking Sony the internals out of the computer, they've made more room for speakers so they sound better than ever. It's kind of like, this wall of sound coming from the whole machine rather than just one speaker port. And if you're someone that worries about fan noise, it's almost never there. They will kick in if you are exporting or transcoding video, but that's the only time we really had them. I also don't wanna forget that there is a touch ID on the keyboard, which is pretty cool. They can do that wirelessly, but I kinda wish it was face ID. I'm not sure why they can pull that off. The way Apple's lineup works now is you really just choose your form factor and they're all gonna get similar performance. The biggest difference is at sustained loads, like exporting video for a long time, the iMac will do better because it's got more fans. Then the MacBook Pro will do better than the MacBook Air. And that's how you choose the next computer you're gonna buy. It's very simple. So if you're not planning on buying a desktop, I do have a video all about 13-inch MacBook Pro. So go watch that. And otherwise, I'll see you at WWDC.